Born six years apart, Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr would become both colleagues and friends. While they couldn't have been more different in terms of personality, lifestyle, and working arrangements, they shared a passion to understand the fundamental workings of nature, and through that passion, they would change how we understand both the structure of space and time, as well as the nature of matter. Einstein was the pioneer, opening vistas through his groundbreaking work in relativity and in defining the quanta. His mind touched nearly every major topic in physics from 1905 to 1925, and what it touched changed. He was, however, both revolutionary and conservative. His views on what constituted an appropriate scientific theory were rooted in the ideas of the 19th century, and even as he overthrew the classical structure of physics that had reached its full fruition during that time, he never left behind the assumptions that had led to the scientific advances that had built upon the physics of Newton. Bohr, on the other hand, was the great teacher and collaborator. While certainly a gifted scientist whose ideas about the atom would advance Einstein's quantum of light from mathematical stopgap to a practical explanation of the structure of the atom, it is arguable that this was not his greatest contribution to science of his time. Rather, it could be said that it was his institute in Copenhagen that nurtured and developed so many talented individuals of the next generation, men such as Heisenberg, Pauli, and Dirac, that was his lasting legacy. It was there in Copenhagen, as well as in Born's Research Institute in Göttingen, that our view of the nature of matter was deeply shaped by matrix mechanics, the uncertainty principle, and the description of physical processes based on a probabilistic picture of causality. This led to the development of a philosophical framework that would come to define an understanding of the quantum worldview that is still the dominant perspective today, even if just barely. But how did this happen? Like so much in science, it was born of controversy and dialectic. Initially, this was between Bohr and Heisenberg in debates at Bohr's Institute in Copenhagen that were occasionally so acrimonious that the two men had to take leave of each other and Pauli was eventually called in to mediate. However, beginning in 1927, after the internal differences had been smoothed out, if not completely resolved, the dialogue shifted. It turned out that Einstein's view of what a scientific theory should be did not mesh with the new picture emerging from the Copenhagen Göttingen Munich group. Over the course of the next 30 years, the two scientific giants of their generation would spar over the best way to interpret quantum physics. Known as the Bohr-Einstein debate, the lengthy conversation held over the years at conferences and in the pages of prestigious journals would clarify and sharpen our understanding of the world of the very small and the inherent strangeness found there. Just as notable, however, was the way in which the debate transpired. Never rancorous and always with great mutual respect and admiration on the part of the two contestants, if not their disciples. As such, it stands as a shining example of how the loftiest of scientific dialogue should proceed. Hello and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 2, A History of the Atom. Episode 25.2, Supplemental. The Bohr-Einstein Debates. The Road to Brussels. In this episode and the next, I would like to consider the scientific conversation that took place between Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr on the meaning of quantum physics especially as related to what would eventually become known as the Copenhagen Interpretation. Historically, this conversation is known as the Bohr-Einstein debate, but we should be somewhat careful in using this terminology given the context of today. When we say debate now, I'm guessing that many associate that word with men and women on a stage engaging in a lively back and forth 
sometimes focused on the issues at hand, but often wandering into the issues that are tangential and sometimes involving straw man or ad hominem attacks. Due to the modern media's love of controversy and drama, there is today a tendency for debates to become acrimonious and centered around topics of a personal nature rather than about the central issues of disagreement. The Bohr-Einstein debate stands as a shining example of how an intellectual discourse centered around a disagreement can and should take place. The debate was something that began in the informal discussions of the 1927 Solvay Conference, continued at the 1930 Solvay Conference, and then, then moved into the journals of physics, especially as the rising tensions created by Hitler's Nazi regime in Germany made meeting more difficult. Throughout the debate, especially when they could meet in person, the two men went out of their way to speak and write from a place of mutual respect and admiration. Never was there rancor between them, even when one seemed to have the upper hand in the continuing exchange of ideas. Each man communicated from a place of deeply held beliefs about the physical universe, but both seemed to recognize that in having participated in the first revolutions of modern physics, their perspectives could well be overturned with a single experiment or recasting of understanding. I think it was this recognition that led to a certain humility that helped knit the fabric of the debate. Nevertheless, it should be said that neither man fully convinced the other of the correctness of their views. To fully understand the issues of the debate, it is useful for us to remind ourselves of the context in which it took place. To do this, I'd first like to talk about the relationship the two men had, and then I'd like to review the Copenhagen interpretation and Einstein's fundamental objections to it. For those who'd like a fuller exposition of this topic, I would again refer you to the Odyssey's earlier episodes. The initial acquaintance of the two men was through an interest in each other's work. As the younger of the two, Bohr had read the work of Einstein's Miracle Year when, in 1905, the older man had written four papers that had fundamentally challenged the ideas of classical physics. Whereas Einstein had worked in the more central areas of physics at the turn of the century, namely electromagnetism and thermodynamics, Bohr had been engaged in research around the emerging field of atomic physics, first through the study of electrons and conductors, and then in understanding the structure of the atom through work with Rutherford. The intersection of their paths came when Bohr, in attempting to explain the electron orbits of Rutherford's nuclear model, used Einstein's quanta of light to explain the energy level transitions to great effect. Just a few years later, Einstein, who had initially been skeptical of Bohr's model, used it to derive the Planck distribution of blackbody radiation by assuming three mechanisms in which light interacted with the atom. The first two, originally suggested by Bohr, were the absorption of a photon to cause an electron to jump up one energy level, or maybe more, and the emission of a photon by an electron jumping down to a lower energy level. To this, Einstein added a third process, known as stimulated emission, wherein an electron transition could be induced by interaction with another quanta of light of the appropriate wavelength. It is from this work that Einstein speculated on the development of a piece of technology that would take advantage of the stimulated emission to create coherent beams of light. Of course, we know this technology by its modern acronym, LASER, for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. It was also in this paper that Einstein coined the term photon as the name for a light quantum. In this way, the two became engaged in each other's scientific work. However, as Einstein was trapped in Germany during the years between 1914 and 1918, and Bohr, as a citizen of neutral Denmark, was more or less restricted to traveling to Great Britain and Scandinavia, the two didn't have much of a chance to meet. They did, however, have mutual collaborators, most notably Paul Ehrenfest in Holland and Arnold Sommerfeld in Munich, who saw the benefit of the two men eventually meeting and getting to know each other. Once the Great War ended, the barriers to scientific collaboration did not come down, but rather were actually strengthened. In 
As part of the war's aftermath and the Entente power's desire to punish Germany for its role in starting the conflict, especially with respect to its violation of Belgian neutrality, German scientists were generally banned from international meetings and scientists from Entente powers were tacitly forbidden to attend meetings in Germany or publish in German scientific journals. While this would normally have applied to Einstein, as he was part of the faculty in Berlin and a member of the Prussian Academy of Sciences, this restriction was relaxed due to his dual German-Swiss citizenship and his prestige, especially after 1919, when a number of research teams confirmed the predictions of the general theory of relativity when it came to the bending of starlight by the mass of the sun. As a citizen of a neutral power, Bohr also faced relaxed restrictions on where he could travel and who he could meet with. As such, Max Planck was able to arrange for Bohr to give a lecture on atomic physics and quantum theory in Berlin in April of 1920. As part of this visit, Bohr would finally have the opportunity to meet both Planck and Einstein. During this week, the two got along famously, even if they disagreed about a few things. One of the big issues from Einstein's work on the interaction between electrons orbiting around the nucleus of the atom and the photon was that when a photon was emitted in that emission, that emission turned out to be essentially a random process. Much like the case of radioactive decay, the time an electron would remain in an excited state in a higher energy level was characterized in a statistical way through something very much like a half-life. In other words, if one had a million hydrogen atoms, all with a single electron in the first excited state, known as the n equal 2 energy level, one could say how long it would take for 500,000 of the atoms to have their electron transition to the lowest energy level, but not which atoms would be the ones to undergo the transition. Another way to say this is that each atom would have a 50% chance of having its electron transition from the n equal 2 energy level down to the energy n equal 1 energy level and emit a photon in that given amount of time called the half-life. To use an example from Manjit Kumar's excellent book, Quantum, Einstein, Bohr, and the Great Debate about the Nature of Reality, it would be like letting go of an apple and knowing that it would eventually fall but not being sure when that would actually take place. Additionally, what also troubled Einstein was that he couldn't predict mathematically which the direction the photon would be emitted in. As such, he felt that the results called into question the validity of causality and Newtonian determinism. Not long after the meeting with Bohr, Einstein would write Max Born, quote, that business about causality causes me a lot of trouble too. Can the quantum absorption and emission of light ever be understood in the sense of the complete causality requirement or would a statistical residue remain? I must admit that there I lack the courage of my convictions, but I would be very unhappy to renounce complete causality." Unquote. Even with these doubts, Einstein convinced himself that additional work in atomic physics would resolve the issue by finding an underlying hidden cause for this behavior. He believed very strongly in the ideas of strict causality and determinism in physics and was not willing to give up those fundamental underlying principles on the basis of what was, especially in 1920, a not very well understood set of experiments and explanations. Bohr, on the other hand, wasn't so sure. It would be this riddle, in part, that would lead him, Kramers, and Slater to put forward the idea that energy might not be conserved in electron-photon interactions as an act of desperation to save the semi-empirical and semi-classical picture he and Sommerfeld had been developing. Their technical disagreements aside, Bohr and Einstein left the meeting having begun a lifelong friendship. While I'm pretty sure such things didn't exist in post-Great War Europe, we might be tempted to call their relationship a bromance these days. Einstein would write to Bohr shortly after the meeting, quote, Seldom in my life has a person given me such pleasure by his mere presence as you have. I am now studying your great publications and, 
unless I happen to get some stuck somewhere, have the pleasure of seeing before me your cheerful boyish face, smiling and explaining." Unquote. To Paul Ehrenfest, he wrote, quote, Bohr was here, and I am just enamored of him as you are. Unquote. Bohr was equally taken with Einstein, writing in reply, quote, It was to me one of my greatest experiences to have met you and to talk to you. You cannot imagine what a great inspiration it was for me to hear your views from you in person. Unquote. The two would again meet briefly later that year when Einstein stopped off in Copenhagen on his way to an engagement in Norway. In 1922, both men would be awarded Nobel Prizes for their work in quantum physics. Einstein would receive the deferred 1921 prize and bore the award for 1922. While Einstein happened to be away in his speaking tour for the formal presentation of the prizes, the two men would meet again in 1923 in Copenhagen. When Bohr met Einstein at the train station and the two boarded the city train that would take them to the Copenhagen Institute, so engaged in conversation did they become that they missed the correct stop not just once, but many times, riding the line back and forth until they finally had the presence of mind to get off in the right place. As before, the time the two men spent together was a true meeting of the minds in discussing the important topics in atomic physics of the day including the crisis the Bohr-Sommerfeld model of the atom was increasingly becoming. Little did either know that they stood on the precipice of the second quantum revolution, as in just the year or so, the Ph.D. dissertation of Louis de Broglie would land on Einstein's desk in Berlin, and Max Born would send first Wolfgang Pauli and then Werner Heisenberg to work as assistants to Bohr. Following this would come the great outpouring in 1926 of the solid, respectable physicists from Zurich who would become Einstein's ally in the debate to come. Schrodinger's wave mechanics would offer up a compelling alternative to Heisenberg and Born's matrix mechanics. And even though both Pauli and Dirac would show the mathematical equivalence of the two approaches, the physical and philosophical interpretations of the reality they offered couldn't have been more distinct. Four years after 1923 would see a fundamental paradigm shift in how researchers in the relatively tiny field of atomic physics came to understand the behavior of the systems they were studying, namely the state of the electron in the atom and its interaction with the photon. One view of this paradigm shift is encapsulated in what is known as the Copenhagen interpretation, though it wasn't really called that at the time. It would be this interpretation of the meaning of quantum theory that would be the subject of the debate between Einstein and Bohr. In order to better understand the context of the debate, let's review the main points of this particular interpretation and Einstein's objection to it. If you don't mind, I'll refer back to my own explanation from an earlier episode for the main points. So, here, in a nutshell, is the Copenhagen interpretation. First, Quantum mechanics generalizes classical mechanics rather than discards it. Second, there is a thing known as the wave function that represents the state of the system. It exhausts what can be known in advance of an observation about a particular occasion of occurrence of a system. And beyond it, there are no hidden parameters. The description of the system given by the wave function is probabilistic. Third, when thinking about the generalized classical ideas, things like position and momentum, one must also think about how they are operationally realized. Another way of saying this is that one must be fully aware of how these things are going to be measured in real experimental setups. Fourth, if you accept Heisenberg's uncertainty principle as the mathematical result or outcome of the commutation relationship, then you have to give up the strict idea that strict causal prediction and determinism are possible on the microscopic level. 
Fifth, as a corollary to this fourth point, Heisenberg asserts that the observer, or at least the observer's choice of measuring instrument, affects the system through interfering with it. Sixth, in the principle of complementarity, you have the statement that to understand a system, you are limited to classical descriptions, of which you must use mutually complementing descriptions to understand the quantum system. Finally, seventh, in what is known as the strong position or interpretation, Bohr says you can't get past this description of the nature of quantum systems. In other words, there isn't going to be some better theory down the road that will allow you to return to purely classical descriptions of things or that doesn't require uncertainty, a probability-based interpretation of quantum behavior, and a need to use complementary classical descriptions of a system's behavior to fully account for the quantum nature of subatomic particles. So, what are Einstein's objections to this view? For Einstein, the fact that the Copenhagen interpretation put very real limitations on our knowledge about physical systems was troubling. One of the questions that can be raised in the relationship to quantum mechanics is whether one can have a proper scientific theory when it can only make probabilistic predictions about the states of systems. Does science require some sort of determinism in its hypothetical process? Does such an explanation undermine one of the assumed basic functions of scientific inquiry, coming up with causal connections between things and nature? Einstein felt that when deterministic causality was abandoned, as the Copenhagen interpretation required on the microscopic level, he thought you abandoned one of the fundamental reasons something like science existed in the first place. Following on this, he wondered if one could have a scientific theory that only gives complementary descriptions. Shouldn't you have a theory that gives a single, unified description of a system and its behavior? Isn't that one of the fundamental goals of science? The big accomplishment of the 19th century science, in many cases, was to come up with a single framework under which all phenomena could be accounted for. In physics, that's the great triumph of Newtonian mechanics coupled with Maxwell's electromagnetic theory. Finally, Einstein raised questions regarding objectivity. If, in some sense, the observer becomes part of the system by choosing a measurement apparatus and procedure, did that undermine scientific inquiry in some way? For Einstein, the single most crucial aspect of science was that it could come up with descriptions of the natural universe that are independent of us. Einstein's criticism of the entire endeavor was that if you have a theory that sacrifices causality, unity of description, and objectivity, then the theory shouldn't, said, shouldn't be said excuse me, to be scientific, and thus it could not stand as the end of the discussion. For him, that meant that there must be another theory that did not make these sacrifices that had not yet been arrived at. These views will form the foundation of the decades-long debate that commenced at the 1927 Solvay Conference and continued until Einstein's death and even beyond, both in the last work of Bohr and in the work of the physicists that would take up the argument in the years after their death. The questions Einstein asks of those who held what has become the dominant view of how we interact with the reality around us, at least on the scale of the very small, are fundamental to both the idea of what science is and what the nature of reality really is. While the Copenhagen interpretation was first put forward in its most complete form at the 1927 Solvay Conference held in Brussels, Belgium, Einstein had heard the broad brushstrokes due to Bohr having presented them at a few months earlier at a conference on atomic physics in Cuomo, Italy. The structure of the Solvay Conference held in late October of 1927, was for two broad reports on the state of experimental physics with respect to quantum theory to be presented the first day by William L. Bragg and Arthur Compton. The second day was given over to a morning reception, and then in the afternoon, 
Louis de Broglie gave a presentation on the theoretical nature of quanta in general as applied to both photons and electrons, as well as an explanation of his new pilot wave theory, something that received very little support during the ensuing discussion. On the third day, the assembled physicists heard presentations from Born and Heisenberg on matrix mechanics in the morning and Schrodinger on wave mechanics that afternoon. Each of these sessions began with a report from the presenter followed by a time for questions and discussions within the group. It was during Born and Heisenberg's session that the full version of the Copenhagen view was shared for consideration. Now, One thing you may have noticed in that description of the first three days of the conference was that neither Einstein nor Bohr gave a report. That's because neither man felt they had been involved enough in the nuts and bolts of the work to be in front of the group, but rest assured that both had worked with and through the actual presenters, Einstein with his Berlin, co Berlin colleague Schrodinger and Bohr with his protégés Pauli and Heisenberg, to make sure that their ideas were woven into the talks that were given. At this point, the conference was suspended for a day for many of the attendees to join a celebration of the French physicist Auguste Fresnel on the 100th anniversary of his death. This break gave the individual members of the group some time to think over what they had heard, especially the Copenhagen picture of reality that had been presented by Heisenberg. When the conference reconvened on Friday, the sessions were given over to a format of wide-ranging but moderated discussion led by the sort of dean of physicists, Hendrik Lorentz. At some point during the day, Bohr was asked to give an extended explanation of the implications of the Copenhagen interpretation on causality and determinism, something that was so central to the discussion that Bohr would submit a paper to the, on the topic for the conference proceedings. The attendees would later stress that Bohr's comments were clearly aimed at attempting to convince Einstein of the correctness of these ideas. And it was at this point that Einstein issued his first challenge to the picture that Bohr was espousing. To understand Einstein's approach, we should digress for just a moment into a discussion of the structure of argument. When one makes an argument, he or she will first present premises, and then from those premises, draw appropriate conclusions. These conclusions then become the premises for the next stage of the argument. Now, to contradict someone's argument, you either have to undermine their premises or show that their conclusions do not follow from the premises. Einstein knew that Bohr was too good a thinker to make the second kind of mistake, something known as a non sequitur. Bohr's conclusions about causality, however, rested on the correctness of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and Born's probability interpretation of Schrodinger's wave function. If Einstein could show that either of these do not work in every case, then he will have undermined Bohr's entire description of reality. And so that's where he began his attack. As was his wont, Einstein began with a thought experiment, something he drew on one of the chalkboards in the room. Now before I describe this particular Gedanken experiment, let me share that one of the most difficult things to do as I've prepared this episode is to try and explain the various imagined physical apparatuses Einstein and Bohr used during their debate. In this case, at least, it turns out that a picture really is worth a thousand words. So if you find yourself getting lost, you may find it very useful to pop on over to the podcast website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com, to take a look at the diagrams for the episode I've posted there. They'll give you a much better sense of what the two men are arguing over. <laughs> 
So let's get back to Einstein's contribution to the discussion on day four of the conference. Imagine, he said, an opaque screen with a single small slit in it through which light may enter a chamber. The back of the chamber is a semicircular photographic plate upon which the light may fall, thus exposing the film. Now, since the photons can act like a wave, those that pass through the slit will spread out from the slit in what is known as a diffraction pattern. Think of this as waves spreading out from a semicircular pattern towards the back of the chamber. However, since the photons are actually particles, they will strike the photographic plate in specific places just like tiny marbles. From this system, Einstein makes an argument about what the Copenhagen interpretation description says will happen. What it says, he contends, is that after the photon passes through the slit and before another observation is made, it has a non-zero probability of striking the semicircular photographic plate at any given point. However, once it strikes the plate at some particular point, that counts as an observation, and at that instant, the probability of observing the photon at any other point on the plate immediately becomes zero. This observation, in essence, collapses the wave function of the photon from a set of probabilities of many different outcomes to a single outcome. In doing so, all of the other outcomes immediately cease to be possible. For this to happen, the collapse must take place in such a way that the information would have to be transmitted at a speed faster than that of light to all the other points on the screen, something forbidden in the special theory of relativity. In other words, if the observation of the photon at point A caused an effect at point B, i.e. the non-observation, there would have to be some very tiny time lag in that cause and effect chain, something not present in the Copenhagen account of the collapse of the probability wave function. This lack of a delay led Einstein, for the first time, to suggest that the Copenhagen explana explanation invoke some sort of, quote, spooky action at a distance. Unquote, a term we should take a moment to unpack. When the first Newtonian descriptions of interactions such as gravitation and electrostatics were created, these interactions seemed to be able to create forces that could act across space without having to make contact with the object they were affecting. As such, these forces were called action at a distance forces, since Newton's original term for what we now call force was action. This mechanism seemed rather ad hoc and very unphysical to Newton and to those who followed him. It had only been resolved by Faraday's creation of the concept of a field in the mid-19th century, something Maxwell had built upon when creating his equations for electromagnetism. With this new representation of the interactions, the action at a distance idea had been consigned to the trash bin. Thus, what Einstein saw in the wave function collapse idea was a resurrection of this rejected non-explanation of how things interacted with their environment. Now, as an alternative, he offered a different explanation. He said that each photon that passes through the original slit will follow one of many possible trajectories as defined by the wave function of Schrodinger. While each photon only follows one path, a large group of them will as an ensemble, statistically adhere to the probability distribution of Bohr. Hence, he said, the version of quantum theory espoused by Bohr doesn't describe the state of a single photon or electron, but it applies to the statistical properties of a cloud of photons, and as such, the wave function does not apply to one photon, but only to a large number of them considered together. In Einstein's interpretation, the probability at a specific point was not a measure of the chance of one photon to strike that point on the screen, but rather the chance of any member of the large group of photons to strike the screen at that point. Bohr and his group responded that they weren't really sure what Einstein was getting at. He seemed to them to be confusing a wave in probability with a wave in three-dimensional space. As the wave function was one in probability, 
and in specifically the probability of finding the photon at some point in space, was not really bound by the restrictions imposed by special relativity, and thus there was no spooky action at a distance. Moreover, Einstein's thought experiment offered no way of making a distinction between the two points of view through observation. As Bohr commented, quote, I feel myself in a very difficult position because I don't understand what precisely is the point which Einstein wants to make. No doubt it is my fault. I do not know what quantum mechanics is. I think we're dealing with some mathematical methods which are adequate for a description of our experiments." Unquote. It was at this point that the session ended for the day. The discussion, however, would be continued in the informal times between the afternoon session on Friday and the morning session on Saturday in the dining room and hotel rooms of the resort the conference was held in, the Hotel Metropole. Heisenberg wrote about the time, quote, During the meeting, and particularly in the pauses, we younger people, mostly Pauli and I, tried to analyze Einstein's experiment, and at lunchtime, the discussion continued between Bohr and the others from Copenhagen." Unquote. In these debates about the meaning of the Copenhagen interpretation, it could be said that the quantum devil was in the details, as Kumar put it in his book. This is because in the Copenhagen view, the means of observation were so important to understanding the how and why the system's behavior happened. If you measured with an apparatus that looked for wave properties, you got a wave, and the same was the case for particles. Add to this the implications of the uncertainty principle, and that meant you had to be super precise in describing exactly how your system was set up and how any measurements would be made. Bohr contended that Einstein's thought experiment wasn't precise enough, and that's what caused the confusion. Bohr's response, developed over the course of the evening and presented in the morning session the following day, pointed out that for the apparatus to act in the way Einstein wanted, both the original screen with the slit and the photographic plate would have to have been perfectly positioned and have a perfectly defined position both in space and time. And that meant they had to have an infinite mass. If this were the case, there would be no uncertainty in the position of the photon when it emerged from the slit, and if this were true according to the uncertainty principle, the photon would have a completely undefined momentum and energy. This would render the physical properties of the photon, such as its wavelength, completely unknowable, something that invalidated the legitimacy of the original thought experiment. Bohr instead proposed a modification to it that would say that the screen had finite mass and thus would move even if just ever so slightly, as the photon passed through it. This would mean, therefore, that the position of the photon would be somewhat uncertain or indeterminate during the process of diffraction on the way to the photographic plate. This would thereby allow a photon with finite uncertainty in the momentum, which would constitute a complete description of the system. Einstein, though, perhaps having looked a few moves ahead in the unfolding chess match, wasn't satisfied with this answer and so proposed a modification to the thought experiment. In his revision, he added a second screen in between the first screen and the photographic plate. The second screen had two slits in it in a recreation of Young's double slit experiment. He now said, taking advantage of Bohr's moving slit in the first screen, that if the recoil of the slit could be measured, then using the law of conservation of momentum, the momentum of the photon could be very accurately determined. So too could the subsequent path of the photon. This would allow the experimenter to determine which of the two slits the sec in the second screen the photon would pass through, thus allowing a very precise determination of the photon's position, I'll bet at a slightly later time. This, however, would allow for a more precise measurement of both the momentum and position of the photon, thus invalidating the uncertainty principle. Check. But was it checkmate? Bohr was sure that Einstein had overlooked something, but at first he couldn't figure it out. 
Soon, though, as the other participants discussed Einstein's modification, he began to realize that Einstein had once again neglected the details, and so he began to sketch out a specific way in which Einstein might be able to make his measurement. In doing this, Bohr was able to show that Einstein had neglected to take into account that the uncertainty principle would apply not only to measurements of the photon, but also to measurements of the momentum and position of the first slit that the photon had to pass through. If one made an arbitrarily precise determination of the momentum of the slit, which was required, of course, to make a precise determination of the momentum of the photon, then one wouldn't know the position of the slit, and thus, wave behavior of the photon would not to be able to be observed at any level. Advantage? Bohr. The two men went back and forth like this for the last couple of days of the conference on variations of the original thought experiment. But in each case, Bohr was able to counter Einstein's objections. Perhaps the most instructive of these in understanding the difference between the two men's points of view has to do with another way of examining this double slit experiment. As I mentioned in a much earlier episode, Thomas Young had shown the wave behavior of light by shining light through two slits on a screen and then observing the resulting pattern of light on a screen behind the first one. For anything that shows wave behavior, one will see an alternating pattern of high intensity waves and in regions where there's no wave behavior at all. For light, this manifests as a pattern of alternating light and dark bands on the screen, something known as an interference pattern. This is what we call the classic double slit experiments. Now, what Einstein knows is if you block one of the two slits, the interference pattern will disappear. Now this makes total sense if you think of light as only being a wave. But if you think of light as a particle, then there's a question that comes up. How does the particle, quote unquote, know there are two slits open before you blocked one of them? And how does the particle know which slit to go through once one of those has been closed? To answer this, I'd like to quote Manjit Kumar. He says, quote, Bohr had a ready answer. There was no such thing as a particle with a well-defined path. It was this lack of a definite trajectory that was behind the appearance of an interference pattern, even though it was particles, one at a time, which had passed through the two-slit setup, and not waves. This quantum fuzziness enables a particle to quote-unquote sample a variety of possible paths, and so it knows if one of the slits is open or closed. Whether it's open or not affects the particle's future path. Unquote. In other words, Bohr says that because the observational method is part of the experiment being done, the researcher has chosen whether to trace the photon's path or observe the interference pattern. If you trace the path, something that you do with a particle, then you'll see a particle. But that will destroy the outcome consistent with the wave-like nature of the photon. If you don't trace the path, you don't see the particle-like nature of the photon, but you will recover the interference pattern. This, therefore, Bohr said, becomes the perfect case study for the complementarity principle. How one makes the observation, in effect, determines the type of outcome one gets. For Einstein, it was this lack of an independent, objective reality that was really more troubling than the probability interpretation component of the interpretation. As I mentioned before, Einstein might have been troubled by the notion that God played dice, but he rejected any formulation of science that didn't allow for an objective reality. This is an objection shared by many physicists even today. By the end of the conference, it was the opinion of most of the attendees that Bohr's position had carried the day. Even in this, though, Bohr was tremendously gracious. He would later write, quote, Einstein's concern and criticism provided a most valuable incentive for us all to re-examine the various aspects of the situation as regards to the description of atomic phenomena, unquote. Aaron Fest would write to his students shortly after the end of the conference saying, quote, Bohr towering completely over everybody. At first not understood at all, Bohr was also there, then step by step defeating everybody. <laughs> 
Naturally, once again, the awful bore incantation terminology. Poor Lorenz is an interpreter between the British and the French who were absolutely unable to understand each other. He was summarizing Bohr, and Bohr responding with polite despair. Every night at 1 a.m., Bohr came into my room to say one single word to me until 3 a.m. It was delightful for me to be present during the conversations between Bohr and Einstein, like a game of chess, Einstein all the time with new examples to break the uncertainty relation. Bohr, from out of the philosophical smoke clouds, constantly searching for the tools to crush one example after the other. Einstein, like a jack-in-the-box, jumping out fresh every morning. Oh, that was priceless. But I am, almost without reservation, pro-Bohr and contra-Einstein. Unquote. By the way, I just have to say, I love Aaron Fest's staccato writing style there. That's just fantastic, isn't it? Of course, neither Schrodinger nor Einstein were won over to Bohr's point of view. Two weeks later, Einstein wrote a note to Arnold Sommerfeld that Bohr's quantum theory, quote, may be a correct theory of the statistical laws, but it is an inadequate conception of the individual elementary processes, unquote. While Bohr may have prevailed in the first round of sparring, Einstein was not close to conceding the point. Unfortunately, the stress of his travels and the increasing pressure on him due to rising German anti-Semitism took its toll on his health. In April of 1928, even as Bohr and Schrödinger were discussing the Copenhagen interpretation via personal correspondence, Einstein collapsed while carrying his suitcase up a steep hill in Switzerland. Diagnosed with an enlargement of the heart, he was confined to bed rest for most of the next year and recovered slowly thereafter. However, by the 1930 Solvay Conference, he was ready to resume the battle with Bohr. In our next episode, we'll consider the atomic clock thought experiment, as well as the EPR paradox, something that would lead to the idea of entanglement and more spooky action at a distance. Until then, full sails on your journey. <laughs>